Welcome to this week's edition of Military Trouble is your office hours. Uh, thanks so much for taking time out of your Wednesday evening to spend it here in the spirit of community, mentorship, and of course, learning. I'm your host, Dave Nava. I'm a lead solution engineer at Salesforce, and I'm a military trailblazer. Each week, as you may be aware, we invite a co-host or sometimes co-hosts to take part in the conversation so we can leverage their experience, their expertise, and their unique perspectives. The focus for tonight's session is actually twofold exploring the enablement manager career path, as well as continuing the conversation on personal branding that we started last week. And so everyone has a unique branding story to tell um, that we can draw from for insights on how to create or improve our own. And so what I'll be doing here is I'm gonna give a quick intro to Nick, and then I'll talk about some admin items, and then I'm gonna turn it over to him because he has some slides to present, and he'll share his screen and take it from there. So let me welcome and briefly introduce our co-host for tonight's session, Nick Charles. Nick is an enablement manager at FrostBank. Prior to his current role, he worked as a Salesforce product owner, a Salesforce consultant, and a program manager. He's an Air Force veteran, a Trailhead Ranger, and a five-time certified Salesforce professional. It is awesome to have you here, Nick, and it's great to be able to hear you. Welcome. Thanks, David. Happy to be here. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I see some new faces out there, which is awesome. For those who may be joining for the first time, or are watching this recording for the first time, I always like to explain the purpose of office hours before we get started. These sessions are intended to be an informal get together for gathering with both military trailblazers and allies, absolutely everyone is welcome, to explore non-technical Salesforce career and branding related topics to help you achieve your professional development and career related goals. And so over the next hour, it's an opportunity for collaborative mentorship. Everyone on the call is encouraged to step up and to help answer questions from your perspective, which of course will add additional diversity of experience to the answers given. Please do keep an eye on the chat window during tonight's session. I've already posted some, uh, some items and others will uh, tend to post as well. You know, things like opportunities for volunteering, for full-time employment, resources, knowledge articles, things of that nature. If you have questions, we'll go ahead and hold them to the end of Nick's presentation. Just go ahead and type them in chat or you can uh, raise your hand at the end and then we will tackle them at that point. Nick, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, David. And uh, thanks again for hosting. This is so cool that you do this every week and you go uh, like above and beyond to do this. It's just amazing. So thank you for your service for the community. And yeah, my pleasure. For those on the line, I'm seeing folks in uniform. I'm seeing awesome beards. I'm seeing moms. I mean, y'all, thank you for joining. This is just going to be a real treat today. This is the highlight of my day and can't wait to start diving into this. So. With that being said, you guys ready? <laughs> all right, let's do it. So um, first of all, quick introduction. My name is Nick Charles. I am from San Antonio. I'm a San Antonio native, go Spurs go. If you're from Texas, I like it, I like it. Um, yeah, that's right. And uh, born and raised here, uh, left in 2005 after graduating high school. I know the hairline doesn't agree with it, but 2005 is when I graduated high school. Ended up at the US Air Force Academy where I went for five years to school there, uh, spent six years active duty. Uh, three of those years were at NORAD in Colorado Springs, spent a little bit of time on a deployment in the Middle East in support of Operation During Freedom, and then actually went back to the academy and taught classes for two weeks. Go blue, I love whoever just said that. Um, so that's kind of the, the story of kind of where we got here. And right about the time I was about to separate, much like you guys, it was time for a big, big pivot. And so personal branding is something to me that is very, very, very important, especially in this time where you're trying to find not only the right fit for you, but you're trying to also communicate how you fit into that mold and how you are the right person for that role. And that's what this personal branding thing is really all about. You can see here, I'm currently the Salesforce enablement manager for our Frost Bank team. We'll talk more about what that is after the presentation if you have any questions. Uh, like David said, five times certified, started back in 2018, started a monthly app building one-on-one workshop in San Antonio, locally at first, um, and helped tons of local folks in person before the dreaded COVID happened, um, help how to learn to teach them how to just basically build apps. What is Salesforce? What careers are out there for me? And how do I build a very simple app? help them contextualize and make it simple. And so started that back in 2018, still going strong. Over 400 people have gone through that course for free and now it's remote. So it's just really cool. That's my, um, probably my, the highlight of every month for me is that chance to give back and see the light bulb go off. Um, 
And so that's a little bit of background and we'll go ahead and get, get started here. So on this next slide, we're given a quick summary of what today's gonna be about. Um, specifically, we're gonna talk about what it means to rephrase the question. In other words, how do, we'll talk about what that question is in a minute, but how do I, how do I contextualize the situation so that I can be successful? I'll explain why that's important in just a few minutes. Then we're gonna move into what, I've called, what I call these three pillars of personal branding, which are actually these actionable steps that you can take with you today and start to reflect on, think through, and be able to act on. These are things that I've found successful in my transition and my journey, and that I hope you find as well. And then we'll talk about what's next. Next slide, please, sir. You know, back in the day, uh, when I showed up at the Air Force Academy, we had an old football coach. Uh, his name was Fisher DeBerry. He had been there for 26 years. He's an old South Carolina gentleman. And I'll never forget the very first meeting that I attended for our football team. This guy gets up in front of the room. The room's dead quiet. And, you know, I'm looking at seniors. I'm looking at juniors. And, like, you can feel it in the room. It's quiet. And he gets up there in his loud South Carolina accent and says, Boys, I'll tell you, if you ever see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. That line right there has always resonated. Y'all, we're turtles out there trying to get on that fence post, and, I, and we cannot get to the top on our own. And so what I want to make sure that we see today is there is a common theme of never alone, never alone, never alone. You'll see that as we go through this, that this is not a journey that you take solo. And the fact that you're here today is a testament to that. And so today, I do really want to give a shout out. One, she's not even here or listening. She may not even watch it. But my wife has been my rock and has helped me get to this point through every transition that I've been through. To, uh, to my mentors, Eric Charsky, Steph Herrera, we'll talk about in a little bit. And my current boss, who's the best boss I've ever had, and that's Tammy Herrera. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go on. Next slide. <laughs> this is me. So I've talked to you guys about how I graduated in 2005. You look on the far left, that's the 300 pound version of me, you know, kind of the, the plus size version. Uh, that was me playing ball back in the day, I used to play offensive line. On the bottom there, that's me graduating, beardless, unfortunately. Off to the right, you see me coaching. Uh, and, and one thing I didn't mention is after my high school or after my six years of active duty, I went to chase a childhood dream of teaching and coaching high school football at a big, powerful program in Texas. That was my dream. I, and, and I'll get into my story a little bit. Essentially grew up single mom. She was a teacher. Teachers and coaches were my hero. They were my escape. They was my way to get out of my situation. And my coaches were always the people I looked up to. So coaching, helping others has always been in my DNA ever since I was little. That top picture is me actually, <laughs> I love this, driving a school bus. Part of being a coach is you get to drive the bus. And so you see there a bunch of students we took on a field trip, love the kids. They brought me so much joy back in the day. And we'll talk about what happened during this journey and how we ended up here. Next, please. Basically, reality did not equal expectations. When I got into coaching, the, the life of a high school football coach in Texas was different than what I had expected. Not only that, but leading up to that, if you think about the series of events that got me there, I really was so immersed and built so many skills over the years. When I was working at NORAD, I was a software program manager there. Um, and and I, I got my MBA and I, and I, and I got my um, I graduate and bachelor's of science in management. I loved business. I actually was really excited about what tech could do. And so I built all these skills and then I went to coach, which was a passion. And when reality didn't meet expectation, I found myself in a really unique situation where, oh man, I think it might be time for a pivot. And so next, next slide, please. So the initial question I ended up asking myself was, all right, Nick, what do you wanna do? Which is like walking into Home Depot and being like, what do you wanna build? It's, I mean, come on, it's, you can do anything, right? And so I started, as I'm sure many of you have during your transition, doing the old shotgun blast technique, you know? I find a role, looks like fun, shoot a resume, get rejected, awesome. 
find a role, looks like fun, shoot a resume, get rejected. Y'all, I was getting rejected left and right. I might as well have been like a geek on prom night or something. I don't know what was happening. But it really, really got to this point where I was like, okay, if the, the question no longer is what do I want to do? Because I, I feel like I can do these things. And sure, they're not landing now, but they will eventually. But really, on this next slide, please, really the question became, man, who are you? What are the things that make Nick, Nick? Like take some time and find those things and prioritize those things that really give you energy and bring you life and find something that aligns to that because there will be something out there for you. You know, I think you can I always tell people companies don't hire uh, um, a job billet, right? They don't hire a slot to fill. They hire people and those people have to fit. So what's the right fit? Well, we got to do a little introspection. And so that's what led to this whole journey of this pivot. And I went from military to teaching. And then right after there was my journey into the Salesforce world. And so that's what we're going to talk about here. Next slide, please. And this really is three years. So in about three years or so to this point, um, ended up during that time getting from the time I made my mind up that I was leaving coaching. It was five certifications. My first role was as a product owner in Frost Bank. I'll talk about how I got that job here in a little bit. Uh, next, I ended up being a senior consultant at a big uh, four consulting firm with Deloitte. And then I actually did what's called a boomerang. Ended up back at, uh, at Frost uh, as a product owner for about a year before getting a promotion to what is now our Salesforce enablement manager. Uh, at a high level of that position, I manage our team of product owners. Think of them as part BA, um, part UX, um, really responsible for owning uh, the product and its development. And then also our Salesforce support team. So we've got 5,000 employees at Frost. If someone has an issue with the system, they call support, they help them as much as they can, and then they forward tickets from there. So that's what I do now. Uh, as mentioned earlier, trained over 400 veterans and spouses in App Building 101 and have seen a lot of those folks go on to pursue Salesforce careers, which to me is my favorite part about the whole thing. And what I love about it is we still stay in touch with these people. So it's just, it's just amazing. I was a panelist on the Trailhead tour. I've been on a uh, podcast or two. Um, and then at the very bottom, one of my favorite things in the world, which I'm so grateful that David allowed this opportunity is public speaking. Next slide, please. But this didn't, this didn't happen easily. Right there, there seemed like there was this insurmountable wall in front of me when I made my mind up to say, look, I've honed these skills. I've, I've honed these skills on the business side. I've honed these skills on the tech side and I want to learn this tech and how these things marry. What's out there for me? Well, how do you, how do you put yourself in a position and brand yourself to say, I am the right fit for this role? And that's what today's about. You're going to hear that journey. Next slide. These are my three pillars of branding. Uh, this is the basic strategy that I followed in order to make this happen. This is something that I came up with during this process and only retroactively went back after reflection and said, yeah, you know what? This was the process that I was following. And I decided to go ahead and document it so I could share it with you today. And so you'll see here to answer that question of who are you, that key question, three pillars here. One is we over me. The next is choose growth. And the last one is send the signal. And so we'll talk to you about what those three, we're going to break those down for you. David, sir, if you would hit next and then one more time, we'll get onto that first one. We're going to start with me, we over me. Love this quote, always applicable. For the strength of the pack is in the wolf and the strength of the wolf is in the pack. That is how these animals thrive out in the wild. And I really feel as humans, it's the same for us. No one of us are strong enough to go through this all alone, to have the right strategy, the perfect placement, building your network. You know, this is a, this is a, um, a perfect parallel. And so if you go one more slide, please. I'm going to talk to you about an example here of someone you may have heard of whose name is Steph Herrera. And so as I, got, as I go into this story, I want to point something out because this is a very fundamental piece of why We Over Me is so important. 
So our bodies, I'm not sure if you've heard this before, but uh, there is research from Dartmouth that suggests that our bodies produce serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine when we help others. What that means is we are built to help others in order for ourselves to grow. And I think that is a fundamental pillar of this part of the conversation, something to remember that when you are helping others, you yourself are growing. So the way this went down, in 2018, when I made the decision to get out of coaching, I, sh I actually spent the first four months studying and learning on Trailhead all on my own. I would do all the trails, I would do all the modules, I was trying to connect with people, but I wasn't sure with who. Um, and I actually got picked up for a program from a company called ProSphere that at the time was helping sponsor a certification for veterans. And so I took that on and I said, sure, four months, I'll go study my butt off and see what happens. So I immersed my way in myself in this material. But I didn't know anyone. I didn't understand what to do from there. I actually went and took my admin exam, failed it, turned back around, passed it. And then I had this cert. I had this little level of knowledge, right? But I didn't know what was next. So I Googled. I had, saw, I had seen a post about Salesforce Saturday, so I went ahead and attended my very first Salesforce Saturday in Austin, Texas. I had all I saw that it was at a coffee shop near me, which was awesome. So I walked in there, opened the door, and there's Steph. And I will never forget that feeling of her almost like excitedly walking up to the door and just giving me this big hug to a random stranger back when hugging wasn't, you know, back when uh, we, we had social distance, right, from, from COVID, and that wasn't a thing. But she came up, gave me a big old hug and said, welcome, this is, uh, this is Salesforce Saturday. Let me introduce you to so-and-so. He's a consultant. Have you met so-and-so? He's an admin. Have you met this guy? He's a developer. He's got his P, you know, his PD2. He's, he's out there killing it. And I was just so overwhelmed with her generosity for someone she literally just met. And the reason I say that is much to the point earlier about helping others helps you. Steph has always stood out as an exceptional person who cares about other people. And that is part of her brand. When you think of Steph Herrera, you don't think of someone who's closed minded and doesn't help. No, this, this lady will absolutely help. And, um, or she cares about people. And I could tell from day one, and so even now, for example, talking about Steph in this presentation is a perfect prime case. I mean, if you didn't know her before, you know her now and you know what she's known for. You know what I mean? It is a full circle situation. Next slide. Why this is important is because when you meet people, or excuse me, you might be, sorry, that's the next slide. You might be asking yourself, well, how do I help? Like, what does this mean? How do I help others? Three big things I want to touch on very quick. One is time. That means if you have the time and you have the skill sets to, to help maybe mentor someone, volunteer for like a Maravis, uh, Maravis for example, um, there are opportunities out there to provide your time to help support others. When it comes to talent, you may have built a very specific skill set and there are boards out there in the Trailblazer community just asking questions left and right. And if you know some answers, share it with the world. And then finally, treasure. This is just one of those things where if you do have that kind of uh, the ability and the desire to donate to a special cause, this is just a really powerful way to help support those organizations. Next slide. Why it's important. This image here is called the flying V. If you've never seen it, the lead bird takes the brunt of all of it. The goal being that the birds behind him are, are, uh, are, have less wind against them, less drag, less friction, so they're able to fly without as much effort. Okay, back when I was 300 pounds, you saw the picture. Back when I was 300 pounds, I was trying to graduate on time. Uh, I had trained for the NFL up through April of my senior year, so I was still 300 pounds. But in order to graduate the academy, you have to pass a physical fitness test. So, which is fine. Push-ups, sit-ups, a run, I can do those things, no problem. But there was also a quarter of the test that was the waist measurement, if you remember back in the day, right? Well, I'm 300 pounds, so I'm already starting at a 75% at a max, and that's if I run an eight-minute mile and a half, and that ain't happening. So uh, I spent about two weeks, um, once I made the decision that the NFL wasn't going to work out for me, I spent the next two weeks crash course, losing weight, trying to get in shape, eating less, and I, mean, I was malnourished, and I was struggling. 
Well, when I showed up to go take my physical fitness test to ensure that I could graduate from the academy, 10 of my best friends, my senior uh, class, best friends that I had played football with, that we had blood, sweat, and tears together, these guys formed a flying V during the run so that I could drag behind them. No one's touching me, but I had that little less wind resistance and they encouraged me the whole way through. And y'all, I passed it with like a second left and was able to graduate. I cannot tell you how important it is to help others because you attract people that help others too. And everyone wins. Extremely important lesson out of all of this. Next slide. We talked about we over me. So now we're gonna to shift to what it means to choose growth. Next slide. <laughs> I remember back in high school, I was in my, uh, I was in my kitchen and the, I went to the kitchen to go pick up a pair of batteries for the remote that had the batteries had died. And there was two packs of batteries in there. There was one called like power battery and then there was this Duracell and my step, I went to go grab the power batteries because I was like, no, the name, I, at that time, I'm young, naive, like power battery, man, this thing's going to last forever. So I grabbed these things and my stepdad looks at me and he goes, what are you doing grabbing those things? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And he was like, why don't you grab the Duracell batteries? I was like, because these are power batteries, baby. These are the good ones. And he, <laughs> he says, okay, I want to talk to you about something real quick. When you think of Duracell, you think of dependability you think of longevity, and you think of just a reliable product. They are known for reliable product. And in that moment, I realized, okay, that's what it really kind of means. Or it's reflecting on that, I realized, okay, this is really kind of what it means to have a brand. That when someone thinks, you know, I'm looking at uh, David Nava, Nava, they immediately go, I know exactly what I think of when I think of that guy. I think of someone who gives to the community. I think of someone who works relentlessly. I think of someone who is selfless and I think of someone who actually cares. Those are things, at least that I personally think about, David. And those are things that you've established that brand, that Duracell battery. So my question to you on this next slide is, how do you become a Duracell battery? Right? It's like, how do you, how do you get to that level? And so we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. This is Clay Hendricks. He was my offensive line coach in college. I had just gotten off a, a bad leg injury and I was at my first practice back heading into my senior year. The very first drill, if y'all can imagine how hungry and excited I was to get back on the field after weeks off to get out there and just play again. Y'all, I was going full tilt, knocking the snot out of people, it was great. And Coach Hendricks, after the very first drill, I mean, I teed off on some guy, and <laughs> Coach Hendricks stops the drill and goes, hey, you know what that's called? No, coach. He's also from South Carolina, in case you want to. That's called the give a damn factor. It's called the give a damn factor, and you can't teach it. You just, or you either have it or you don't. And so if you go to this next slide, that's what this is all about. In order to choose growth, you got to have that give a damn factor. And the two variables that I believe make that give a damn factor is motivation and action. If you have the right motivation and the right intentions in line, and you are willing to take the right amount of action, there's your give a damn factor, and you can stand out. I bring that up because when I was studying for my Salesforce exam, I, <laughs> I was still teaching at the time. So I was waking up at four in the morning, and I was getting up, getting my coffee. I would study till about six. Now book it to school for our first meeting at 6.30 or so. Go to school during lunchtime. I would knock out a trailhead module, keep going to work. At the end of the night, I would come back, do another couple hours, call it a day. And it was a consistent grind for months in order to get that turnaround. You cannot snap the finger and get results. It takes motivation and action. Next slide. Finally, we're going to give you some actionable steps here on how to send the signal. Next slide. I mentioned earlier my wife. Great story from when we first moved in together. I was in the kitchen and we, she was cooking and I was helping her kind of get some supplies ready. And she says, hey, you know, Nick, can you go grab the, you know, the garlic salt or whatever? I was like, no problem. Go over there, open that, grab that thing, hand it to her. I'm leaving this cabinet open, you know? And I'm like, oh, I gotta go to get something else. So I leave the kitchen. I look over, she, she's cooking on one side of the kitchen. 
walks to the other side, shuts the cabinet, goes back. I didn't think anything of it. So then later we're doing some stuff and same thing. Again, she's like, can you get this? I have no problem. Open the cabinet, grab it, provide it, move on. Not a minute later, she comes, shuts it, and goes back. Then it clicked. Okay, something's going on with this cabinet situation. And so we very briefly had a talk. I said, hey, listen, what's going on here? And her whole thing was, hey, the, just in terms of just the way the kid, you know, prefer that it could shut. Here's why. She gave her reasons. I listened. And at the end of it, I'm sure you guessed it, I went ahead and started shutting the cabinet. But the reason I bring that up is because your ability to communicate and level set on expectations of, of what you need and who you are is extremely important. Same when it comes to communicating your brand. You have to have a strategy for how you communicate that brand to others. So let's go to this next slide, David. You might be asking, well, what is my brand and how do I send it? Next slide. I'm gonna take you through three actionable steps that you could take today. You could walk out of here and start looking at this and, and, and go ahead and get this thing rolling. The first pillar here, or the first stage, is defining your own personal values. What does Nick stand for? What does Steve stand for? What about Michael, George, et cetera? What are those personal values? I'm not talking anything professional here. Just what do you care about? Next, draft a statement using those values. Try to find a way to, for those of you that like Excel and all that, concatenate all these words into some kind of meaningful message. <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, oh, yeah. And then finally, start communicating. We're going to talk about the different channels, kind of content, and the connections that you make. Next slide. When it comes to personal values, it took me, uh, it didn't take me very long, actually, to define the things that I was like, well, what do I love most? The five things that I'm like, this fires me up. I'm someone who loves to have fun. I love to be creative and have a creative space where I can create. I love to create. Uh, leadership has always been a big part of my life, always growing up in team sports and helping bring others along. Teamwork, extremely important. Like I said earlier, try to on a fence post, right? Then finally, my personal faith. And that's just something that I, I feel is the foundation of everything. And so these five things I looked at and was like, okay, so if I were to sum up who is Nick Charles in a statement, had to make one sentence using these things, what would that be? If you're not sure, by the way, I think there's a, um, there are Google, there's a site out there, you know, you can Google personal values list and there's a whole glossary of items to choose from, but really just take the time to think about it. Next slide. What I ended up landing on was this. <clears throat> Who is Nick? Well, I'm someone who wants to have fun, sparking creative team-oriented results by participating in the growth of others. In other words, I love to help people, and I love to see when helping people results in some kind of creative solution or some kind of meaningful thing that helps others thrive. I love that, and I know you can't do it alone. So these are the kinds of things that I would say, if you were to sum me up in just a quick sentence of who I am, this is me. And the reason that's important is because all of my messaging, the way that I present to you, the way that we converse when we're in LinkedIn messages, the way that we talk on the phone, all of that will usually center right back around here to this. I am this right here. And this is what you're going to get no matter the time of day. Next. Once you kind of have that, 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 voice behind you and you have that understanding. Well, now how do I start to find the right kind of content that aligns with who I am and what I want to become? And then what channels do I want to look at in order to make that happen? We all know as Salesforce professionals, LinkedIn's obviously a great place to start. Twitter is kind of this unofficial voice of LinkedIn. I kind of think of it as the fun LinkedIn, right? It's a place where people can share more than just, you know, uh, an article, uh, a funny or an interesting article. Um, but when you, when you nail down who you are and you nail down that voice, now you're looking at these channels and how can I produce content that aligns with these channels? But not only that, am I making sure that I'm reaching out to the right people? So are you connecting with people that, uh, that um, would be of interest to you in this career that you're kind of leaning towards? You know, are you reaching out to exact, exactly? I just saw David here post Brooks Johnson, uh, is, is a great example of, of someone that, yeah, if you don't know the guy, 
I would definitely connect with them, especially if you're interested in becoming a developer. Um, but you know these people and you got to know where to kind of look. And if you don't know, ask. Completely cool. You can even post it on Twitter. Like, hey, y'all, I'm interested in learning about a product marketing role. Um, you know, who's out there that knows anything about this and you know, what do you like about it? And you'll be surprised how many responses you get, people tagging people left and right. It's an amazing ecosystem. So just so grateful for it. But again, lean back on it, defining your values, drafting up that statement, and then looking at your channels, content, and connections will help you start to communicate that message of who you are. Next slide. And that's our three pillars of branding that ultimately I've used and seen successful when making that transition from being a teacher coach into being a product owner at Frost. And I want to close the loop on this story because it's extremely important. Steph Herrera, the same one who earlier I said went out of her way to give me a big hug the day I met her. She actually, after I started attending more Salesforce Saturdays, was the referral for myself for my first role for a Salesforce role at Frost Bank. She went out of her way to reach out to the hiring manager. Didn't even know they were kind of, I think, loosely connected. They had met in the past, but they, I mean, they were acquaintances and reached out to her and said, this guy is interested in this role and I think you should take a look at him. And that's what ultimately opened up the, the little, you know, antenna and ultimately led to where we are today. Next slide. Last thing I want to leave you with, if all else fails, be you. You know, you were made special. You were made to make a difference. I believe that every single person who is dialed in today was made uniquely for a purpose. Be yourself and you will find that purpose. Be deliberate. Don't sit back. Your brand cannot be a passive brand. You've got to engage with those around you if you want to communicate that brand. Which leads to the next one, just take ownership. If things aren't moving the direction, you don't. if things are moving the direction you don't like, check and adjust. Take a look at where you're at. What can change? Tailor, pivot, let's go. And you can do it. And then remember, it's okay to fail. And what I mean by fail here, it's okay to make the wrong decision. We've all done that. And uh, making a wrong decision is not the end of the world. And I, I just think it's very important to put out there that you can find a way to bounce back because um, pivots happen all the time. So just wanted to share that story and share some success, um, some actionable steps to take so we can uh, help you guys uh, better understand how to effectively establish your personal brand. So David. Thanks so much, Nick. That was awesome. Um, you know, it's easy to see why why you like public speaking because you're you're very good at it. There's tons of stories there um, that we could chat all night about. I, I love the fact that you know your very first Salesforce Saturday meeting was with the person who created Salesforce Saturday. Like, how, how much better does it get than that? So for <laughs> folks that, that aren't aware, um, Stephanie Herrera, Salesforce MVP, actually created the the worldwide phenomenon, which is Salesforce Saturday, which is anywhere from Austin to India. Uh, and so um, that's that was who uh, Nick's first um, meeting was with. So pretty cool, but awesome. Thanks so much for sharing all your experiences. And I love your presentation. I was taking notes too. You define personal values, draft a statement, start communicating. Everyone out there has, you know, um, personal professional characteristics that you can use and, and draw from to create your personal branding statement. You know, so if you're military or military spouse, it's flexibility, organization, work ethic, you name it. All it takes is some time to, to think about those. And then like Nick was talking about, craft that statement and start communicating it. So let me go ahead and open up the chat window. If anybody has any questions, uh, go ahead and, and either you know raise your hand and, and, and go for it or paste them in chat. There we go. Dan, you have the floor and then we'll go to Russell after that. Sure. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Nick, great, great presentation, man. You did a great job. You could definitely tell you're a public speaker for sure. Uh, fantastic. Um, I just actually, this is more of a comment because I know you're an Air Force Academy graduate. Um, my dad is an Air Force Academy graduate and I wear his ring in honor of him. So I thought I'd bring that up. I like that. Ring knocking all day, baby. I'm Navy myself because I was like, I'm not going to join the Navy and end up back in my hometown. So that's why I didn't join the Air Force. <laughs> Love it. Thank you for sharing. Awesome. Sir. You're welcome. Thanks, Dan. All right, let me go to my queue here. Aaron, uh, you're up. Hey, Nick. Hey, all. Uh, cheers for that. Uh, brief, a little bit late out here, and uh, there's only one type of football. I think you'd call it soccer, but we'll let it go. 
my question to you is, we've all got a, a brand in the military, me as a, a soldier initially, then becoming an officer and now trying to make that pivot into the commercial space and the different language and the same but different culture. What was the biggest challenge? But also uh, the second point of that, what was the best um, part of you you took across to that uh, civilian world? That's a great question, Aaron. Um, first of all, thank you for your service and uh, thanks for dialing in I'm from all the way over there. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, but you know, I think one of the biggest challenges out the gate, out of the gate, was remembering that just because I wore a uniform, that was not mutually exclusive of having the qualities needed for a successful career. Otherwise, in other words, you, Aaron. It's the person behind the uniform and it's the, uh, it's the victories that you, the strides you made in your role that define who you are. It's less about the fact that, um, you know, I think for example, my first resume that I was submitting to people was talking about volume of weapons on target. I couldn't even, it was like, hey, this is pretty aggressive language for a resume going to a Salesforce job, you know? But, but really that's what it came down to is I had to make a mental shift to go, it's not about that. Let's look at the victories and the way that the qualities it took to make those things happen. Let's focus on those. What victories did I have in the military that could be translatable? Because people who read the resume for a Salesforce resume are not the same people that look at somebody who reads your resume to apply for, you know, or to move to your next military role, if you will. So I would say that was kind of one of the biggest shifts in mindset for me. One of the challenges was trying to translate that work experience. Um, as far as, uh, can you remind me, sir, the second question? Uh, what's the best part of you, you took across when we talk about our solidity or our commitment and our leadership ability? And you mentioned that and how it's important to be uh, leading from the front and be prepared to step back and let someone else lead when you need to. What's the, the, the unique talent you took from military into that civilian organization? Great question. I think it all comes about comes back to the selfless service portion. I think uh, military as a form of service, um, if anything else, is an indicator that you're willing to go above and beyond and do things that most people are not. And I and if you keep carrying that chip on your shoulder in those conversations and keep leaning back on that as you're doing your informational interviews or you're sitting down during an actual interview, um, keep leaning back on that because it's again the qualities. It's not the uniform. It's the qualities behind the uniform that make that possible. So lean back on those things. Awesome. Thanks so much for the answers, Nick, and for the questions, Aaron. We'll go ahead and go to my question uh, queue here. And I think, um, let's see, Adam, I believe you are next. You've got the floor, sir. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Um, Nick, that was a great presentation. This is probably more just a, a resource, David. I, I've popped a link in the uh, in Slack to you. Um, you know, for those of you who are wanting to kind of learn more about, you know, how do I get started with personal branding in the Salesforce industry? Uh, hopefully, David can share a PDF with you, uh, which will. Uh, there are some slides on there which will give you details on, you know, uh, how to write your subject and what should you put in your title and um and you know what company should i be following and connecting with so um yeah david that'll be a great resource if you can pdf that up and, uh, and share it with this group so yeah absolutely i'm actually i've got it in a pdf right now and i'm just making it Brilliant. completely shareable and yeah. then i'll post that in chat and if you want uh, if you like it go ahead and download it i'll keep it there for a few days before i move it over to um another location so yeah, but, but Nick, you're spot on. It's um, you know, it, it's paramount, not just when you're entering a Salesforce career, but uh, you know, it's creating those connections uh which help you be successful throughout your career as well. Yes, sir. And thank you so much, Adam. Appreciate you being here as well. Always happy to assist. Thanks, Adam. Yep, so that, that link is now in chat. Go ahead and click on that and uh appreciate that, Adam. All right, and we'll move over to uh, Steve. You're up next, and then we'll take Sandeep's question after that. Thanks. Um, so Nick, when you were talking about um, using military jargon in your resume and that type of thing, that's been, I've been out of the military for quite a while now, and, and even from the beginning, that was a big concern. 
And I've thought about that a lot over the years because I've been on both sides of the fence now. I've, you know, been, I've looked for jobs, but I've also been on the hiring side of jobs. And the interesting thing is that it's, it seems like a big dichotomy for people out of, coming out of the military where they don't understand that people that are not in the military just don't understand that jargon. And so it's a very obvious disconnect. But the fact of the matter is that it almost doesn't matter what role you've been in. There's always um, lingo that's only used by that particular uh, field. And so you've got to make sure that you scrub your resume of all that stuff, or you tend to eliminate some people from interest. And I think it really comes down to not so much technically what you did, but what was the outcome of what you did. If you um, decrease the need for resources or if you increase productivity or if you did whatever it was that is comp that is evenly understood by all sectors of business, then I think that you puts you in a much better spot. Um, so that's just my comment, but thank you. Steve, I 1 million percent agree with that statement. And that is a skill um, that you can take with you, not only on your resumes, but for example, right now as a Salesforce enablement manager, part of my role is to radiate the success of the work of our team. And the way we do that is when we're in a discovery conversation and we're trying to learn about the problems being solved, we have to get to the nitty gritty of okay, you're telling us this is taking you too long to fill out this form and manually do this. How long is that taking it? You know, talk, talk to me about the number of hours. Okay, let's say it's that much per form. Let me run a report and see how many of those that you've done in the last year. Okay, that times that. Okay, got it. Now that's the number of hours. Let me ask you, if you were not doing this number of hours on this activity, where would you be focusing your value-added activities? Oh, on this thing? And how long does that take you? Okay, so that long. So if I have this many hours of open capacity, I can effectively create this many more value added tasks, you know? And so it's flipping this paradigm, understanding the, the value and being able to communicate that we could do a whole session on that. Y'all it's, it's a big, it's, it's huge. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Stephen. Uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's great points, Stephen. Nick, um, it, it, that was one of the things that I struggled with most during my transition was translating those, those nebulous skills that I, I knew I had, but couldn't really figure out how to put them in a way that would interest employers, uh, you know, for the jobs that I was applying for. And so, you know, if you find yourself in that position, one of the best things you can do is to have informational interviews. So once you figure out what you want to do, right, go talk to people that do that and say, hey, listen, you know, tell me about your job. What do you like about it? And then have a conversation where you're like, okay, you know, what skills do you need to, you know, to perform your job? Um, and look at your own experience. And after having enough of those conversations, you'll be able to figure out what part of your career relates directly to what you want to do. And you'll be able to translate those skills. Um, it's just, I think you said it earlier, it's, it's learning to speak that language for the industry that you're interested in. Having those conversations, you learn that language, you can translate and there, thereby you can interest employers. Hey, uh, David, really quick, before we, yeah. before we move to the next question, um, Eric Dreshfield, are you on the line right now? He might be on mute or he might not. I am, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. I want to give real quick this guy a shout out. I know you were not expecting this. This was not part of our situation. But during my pivot from teaching to coaching, I wrote a 99-day straight series about my pivot. That was each article was 99 words or less. And it was about lessons learned during the transition. It's on my LinkedIn right now. It's, it's old. It's a couple years old, but still got some really good stuff. But there was someone who would read this thing almost every day and give a little thumbs up, give a little comment and encouragement. Uh, Eric, I need you to know right now, we got to go here. Just thank you for that encouragement during that transition. I would not have happened without that kind of support. So I just wanted to say thank you before I move on. Well, hey, Nick, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yes, sir. That's awesome. Yeah, and it definitely makes a difference, folks. Uh, Sandeep, your hand is up and you are next. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I can always uh, like already feel like it's so positive here. <laughs> uh, my question is actually related to part-time opportunities. So currently in my situation, I got certified being a new mom, a little hard to just transition into full-time and uh, COVID has not really 
helped us anyways um so i'm I, i'm like i'm getting opportunities where it's like full time i am getting those interviews but when i come up like uh about part time because i don't want to overcommit and is it really true getting part time opportunities in salesforce ecosystem is not <laughs> something to look forward to I would say, ma'am, I think before I answer, uh, my experience with part-time work is is none right now. But there is a really good friend of mine. Her name is Brandy Randall. It's Brandy with an I, who is a new mother as well, who also went through a part-time transition, who I think would be a great connection for you. If you were to ping her on LinkedIn and let her know we spoke and that I recommended you talk with her, I think I bet she would be pretty responsive and can give you some pretty good answers, especially given um, this amazing new uh, chapter in your life. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I looked her up on LinkedIn because I'm connected with her as well. So I'll just post that in there. Save you a uh, search. There's Brandy's uh, LinkedIn link. Uh, but Thank great you, question. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Uh, let's see. We had some other hands up, but may, folks may have put them down. Does anyone else uh, want to pose a question? We've got um, about yeah. five minutes left. I do. Okay. Yeah, a couple of questions and comments again. Uh, sorry, I, I talk a lot, so I apologize. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up after uh, Nick, you were talking about branding and being you and being true to yourself so that you're always the person, regardless of somebody sees you at work or out of work, you're the same person. That's just the way it is. And there's a saying in the, in the military and probably all branches, but definitely in the Navy, it's called, you got to have a can-do attitude which means get it done whichever way it takes to get it done. One thing I wanted to say was when I got out of the military, my very first job I got because my wife was in tech. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was in tech in the military. I had no clue what I wanted to do. As a matter of fact, I was probably going to end up doing a uh, contract uh, as a contract worker in the Middle East for the government. I'm glad I met my wife because I was ready to get out of the military but after that, after building a brand and becoming known and building this network and stuff like that, every position I've gotten after that has always become then because I've known somebody. Somebody from my network has reached out to me and said, hey, are you interested in this? Are you interested in that? So building that network is probably one of the most important things you can do for building your brand and, and having those people that you can always count on. Thank you. 100% agree. It's people that will get you there. It's I'm telling you, that whole flock mentality that flying v mentality stick with it always welcome to comment dan thanks very much um so we, we do have a question in chat from jade hi jade uh she says hey nick uh, you mentioned you're creative what's the latest creative thing you've done that you can share <laughs> oh man you guys are gonna like this so i actually have um I have some really cool projects that I'm working on that will be uh, shared here within the next month or two. Um, so please, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, please connect with me because I would love to share um, with the intent of creating joy in the lives of others. Clearly, I'm a big positive guy and I got a lot of joy to give. So please take the joy, let's connect. But there are some fun stuff coming. I actually honestly have tried recently. <laughs> I, I did try stand-up comedy for the first time ever. And y'all, what a rush. I had a blast. The crowd was great. I loved it. And it pushed me out of my comfort zone. I'm pretty sure I was mentally blacked out on stage. I don't even remember being up there. Like as far as like, I was just nervous. Um, but I got some laughs, that's all that matters. It was great. I had such a good time. So always be willing to push yourself. Dora, yes, and do it. I'm telling you, if y'all are interested in doing it, open mic's the way to go. It's a great supportive environment. You get a high five no matter what. So, <laughs> no video. <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody else have a question? If not, I, I do have one to close out the session, but I do want to give you first priority. Uh, Sagal, apologies if I mispronounce your name. You. No. Are up. Yeah, that's right. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Nick. It's a great presentation. Um, I just have like a quick question. So I'm already like working as a uh, senior sales for administrator for a pharma, like a smaller pharma company in Canada. So I'm working with health um, cloud. Um, so one of the things that's great about the job is like, I get to see different parts like consultants and like 
other people as well. And I'm discovering that I do like it men, but also really like more the kind of like really developing and like kind of like solving problems and not knowing what to do and really like spending a lot of time. So my question is, what would be the best in terms of career and also like me, like enjoying myself as well? Um, is it better to kind of like work for like consultant firms because you will have more people and more mentors instead of like a smaller company? Because I really do want to kind of like just um, learn more and really be part of like um, solving problems and not knowing and then always learning and innovation and things like that. So that was my question. Thank you. Great question. And uh, thanks for dialing in from Canada. Um, I think you have to kind of know the general direction of what it brings you joy in the workplace. I'm very big on this feeling of like follow your gut. Your heart's kind of this internal barometer that can tell you what you do and don't enjoy. And if you know you're more into, like I knew, for example, that I did, I never wanted to do what I call the tippy tappy. I didn't want to be the person who built it. I love what the buildings can do. And I love the fact that it solves business problems. That's cool. I'm all about it. But when it came to creating, I was like, okay, I know how to do it, but I don't want to do that all day. Vice versa. If you're one who likes to hear the problem, hear the requirements and dive straight in, that's a great way to go for the developer side. Um, in my experience from a consulting firm, uh, maybe a little skewed. I was I went to Deloitte, like I said, very short stint. It was about seven months. I was flying back and forth from San Antonio to Boston every week with no direct flights. So seven hour flight, one way, each way. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, that was one of those decisions that I look back on and go, you know what? That was a mistake. And it was just because it didn't, the idea of a consultant in some ways, um, the way that I was, the way that I perceived the role um, in my head going in was a little bit different than reality and that ultimately I felt like consultants are more um, when at least in my experience uh, Terrible word, but mercenary and this idea that like we have a job to do you get in there You do it you do it right and you get out don't care about you don't care about your growth get you know from a customer perspective um, and uh, that to me was very uncomfortable for someone who does not value those things So again, you go back you look at my values. It's like oh, what are you doing? It was a mistake but I learned a ton and all those of a great project and took that experience with me back to Frost and ultimately turned things around and got a promotion and loved uh, the people at Frost, So, which is ultimately what brought me back. I'd like to piggyback on that a little bit, Nick. So, I mean, Segal, so it's a great question because th that was exactly what was running through my head uh, when I was making my entrance to the ecosystem in 2018. I had been volunteering for a couple different nonprofits as an admin. Um, and, you know, after a while, uh, you've solved kind of all the big business problems, right? And you're just doing maintenance. You know, you're, you're creating reports, you're handling trouble tickets. Um, and, you know, especially if you work for a nonprofit who may not have access to a lot of capital, you don't have money for all the cool features. I, I got bored. Uh, and so I wanted to have access to new problems. I wanted to explore the, the platform. Um, and so I looked into consulting. And I had a little bit different, um, different experience than Nick did. I really enjoyed it um, you know, because you get to meet tons of different folks uh, across multiple different industries. You know, so you work, you work for one project in the tech industry, you know, another one in healthcare. You never know what industry you're going to go to next. So not only do you get to learn different businesses, but you get broad exposure to the platform, all the different clouds, all the different features. And so if you love to learn, it's just it's like a fire hose effect where it's, it's a ton of learning. Um, and there's never been a period in my career where I have learned as much as quickly as being a consultant. Um, and so, you know, th there's a wide spectrum of, of consulting firms, obviously. You, you can go with a small boutique firm, um, you know, with maybe not a lot of resources and, and they focus on one specific niche to a Deloitte where they do everything and they've got a huge program for, you know, for training you and for certifications. It all depends on, you know, you, you got to analyze all the different factors. How much do you want to travel? Do you want that small team feel or, or do you want the big team, you know, access to resources and, and all the different exposures to their different projects? Uh, that's where informational interviews comes in and you have those conversations. Um, and then I would just I'd close it out by saying, in my experience, it's very fast paced. It's very stressful. It's a lot of work. It was like 65 hours a week, um, week after week. Uh, and, and that's not that's not that's just doing the job. That's not learning. Right. Because I have, 
after hours and before hours, I'd go learn on, uh, uh, you know, customers ask me to do this. I don't know how to do that. I got to go figure it out. And then you do the job, you know, so very long, but it was incredibly professionally rewarding. So I did it for two years and I was like, okay, I'm done. I got to find something else. And now I'm a solution engineer, much more laid back. And, and, you know, I, I love that role. So I would absolutely recommend it. Um, I would just, you know, have those conversations, figure out the type of firm you want to work for, talk to folks at that firm, and then, you know, do it for a while and see how you feel. And if your work-life balance isn't where you want it to be, then get as much as you can out of it from a learning perspective and then do something different. You know, the great thing about the ecosystem is there's so many different roles open that you're not limited to one role. And as long as you know how to configure or develop or both, you can move on to something else. So we are, folks, we are out of time here. We're a little bit past time. Um, you know, Nick, it, it, it was so awesome hearing you talk about your branding strategy and your personal story. And, you know, we had a great conversation. I'm going to have to invite you back because we didn't talk about being an enablement manager at all. <laughs> 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 and I, and I want to get to that conversation. So uh, we'll chat offline. Um, and if you're willing, we'll get you back on here and you can talk about uh, Frostbank and being an enablement manager because I do want to hear about that. You got it. Thank you so much for the opportunity, David. Very, very grateful for this chance. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, it's I think everyone else probably feels the same, but it's incredibly motivating to to hear you speak. And I, I'm like 15 percent happier leaving the call than I was getting on it because, you know, I'm just I'm ready to go. So thank you, Nick, so much. Uh, and thank you to everyone here on the call for spending you know time with us on your Wednesday to learn about the Salesforce ecosystem. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Next week, looking at my calendar here, we have. Um, it's a panel on customer success. So if you ever wondered what customer success folks do, uh, Hilary Zarenajad and uh, Sue Marriott will be here uh, talking about that. So hope to see you next week. In the meantime, have a great rest of your Wednesday evening and have a great and safe week, everybody.